This is going to sound, people are going to go, <gasps> can't believe you just said that. It doesn't matter if people love their job. It absolutely doesn't matter. And here's why. Because some people need a job. And the need to have a paycheck is way more important so they can provide for their family than it is for them to love their job. You shouldn't care about that as a boss because you have no control over that. You absolutely have no control over somebody's motivation to take that job. What you have total control over is the environment that you create. I'm Mark Drager. And as an entrepreneur and strategist, I've built a multi-million dollar marketing agency. I've helped launch startups and transformed international brands. And yet, despite all the success, I still wake up every morning with the feeling that I'm just not good enough. And I've not come close to hitting my potential. And I may never achieve the high hopes that I have for myself. I believe that we all have something to prove to the doubters, to the haters, to the voices in our own heads. And so each week, I share real, tactical advice and the most interesting and inspiring interviews because my goal is to help those of us who have something to prove show the world and ourselves that we have what it takes to make it happen. Welcome to the We Do Hard Things podcast. Today's guest is a former Navy SEAL and a former FBI special agent. Now, during his 13 years with the FBI, get this, he investigated international terrorist organizations, which sounds terrifying to me, was part of the FBI's New York SWAT team, was also attached to the U.S. Army 75th Ranger Regiment through the FBI, for which during his deployment in Afghanistan, he was presented with the FBI's second highest award for valor, the Shield of Bravery. Now, if that wasn't enough, he's the founder of the leadership training organization, Leader 193. He spends his time not training, but empowering. And let me tell you, once you hear the conversation we had, you will clearly be able to see why. You can't spend any time with our next guest without feeling empowered. He speaks with humor, compassion, and just that little hint of grit that seems to come from people who have a background in the military. And while the lessons he shares come right out of combat. I believe they're better served in business or at home. I can't wait to share with you the conversation I had with the author of the new book, The Process, Art, and Science of Leadership, and ice bath fanatic, Errol Dobler. But where I want to start is with the quote, you know, God will not look at your, uh, what was it? God will not look you, look you over, over the for medals, medals, degrees, yeah. or diplomas, but for the scars. That's right. That's um, right. Where, where did that come from? I have not heard that before. That is, and I, I forget who who uh, who said. I don't want to say the wrong the wrong name, but mm -hmm. I you know I used to in when I was when I was a kid I was I just I was enamored with leadership at a very young age, and so I would always pick up just leadership quote books, right? So I you know I knew them all. Why? Sorry, I, I don't, well, I can tell you that the, I think I grew up playing hockey. My parents put me hockey in hockey when I was like four years old. So, you know, the age groups are eight and under and then nine and 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, right? So eight and under, I was like in the eight and under group for what seemed like forever, right? So everybody, you know, Errol, like you're only six, my God. You've you're been Because in, <laughs> right? right? in Canada, we have four-year-olds, we have five-year-olds, we have six-year-olds. Yeah. Uh, it was all eight and under. So, I, you know, I was four playing with the eight-year-olds. In any event, so since I was around for a lot, you know, I was the captain of my team at that young age. And, um, you know, one day my dad says to me, Errol, well, what are you going to say to the boys before the game? And he's what <laughs> like I'm six. Like, what do you mean? What am I going to say to the boys? And he just said, he goes, look, you're the captain. He goes, they, they look to you for leadership. You, you have to say something. Now, who knows what I went in there and said. And my dad was just an ordinary guy, right? He, the most influential person in my life. But he, he wasn't, you know, he enlisted in the Army post-Korea, did his two years. So there wasn't anything dynamic about his background. But it was ever since then, at that young age, where I said, well, I guess this is kind of how it's supposed to go. So I, I think that's what, why I was enamored with leadership. Mm. Um, at least that's the first thing I have to remember. So anyway, I would pick up these books all the time and I would just eat them up. And I, I just read that quote one time and it, it never, ever, ever left me. It just never left me. My dad, when I graduated from college or buds, he got me a, a Rolex watch. 
and he got that inscribed in the back of it. So it's just kind of always with me and I believe it, right? It, it's not, you know, the, the mission is not neat and tidy, right? Mm. The mission is mission accomplishment and scars are going to get you mission accomplishment, not neat and tidy. I have, so, I have so much, you know, and the reason why I wanted to start here is I personally, and, and I think so many of us have so much trouble with that. And part of what I'm hoping to learn from you and others like you and, and even your book, it's the idea that you have a plan, mm -hmm. you execute the plan. And obviously a big part of, 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 you know, I guess military background or whatever is, is realizing that, you know, that things aren't going to go right all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. But, right. but, you know, I come from, you know, marketing and, and strategy in a world where um, if something goes wrong, it's not good enough to fix it. Other people judge you for even letting something go wrong. Mm -hmm. So we carry this baggage and this, this fear of judgment and the fear of screwing up and the fear of shame. And it slows us down and all of these things, like it just destroys us. And what I'm trying to learn is how to get comfortable with the fact that things will go wrong, that you will get the scars. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and it's not, it's not, you're not to blame for not getting in front of something that's out of your control. If you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I do know what you mean. And, and it's easy and it's hard. And here's why it's easy. Cause that's just the way it is, right? That is just the way it is. And, and there's no disputing it. That is not my opinion. It's just, it's going to go wrong. And that's, that's simply a fact it, the one in a million times it goes right. You know, woohoo, good for you. Do you even remember <laughs> that one time? I mean, come on, what are we talking about? So <clears throat> that's, that's why I say, you know, I say to my clients, I say to the groups who I talk to, neat and tidy is not the goal. You have to have a plan. That's first and foremost. If you don't have a plan and things go wrong, I can tell you they went wrong because you didn't have a plan. Hmm. When you have a plan, right, and I have a whole, the whole process that I bring people through, you cover all these elements, you're going to find mission success because one of the elements is contingency planning. Mm -hmm. Let's think ahead, right? Not we can't do this because these things will happen. That's, we don't lead with contingencies. We lead with what can we do to make it work, right? If everything went perfectly, we did these things, would it work? Yes, good, go. Now, we've got that plan. Now let's talk about the things that can go wrong because let's not kid ourselves. That's just the way it is. So when something goes wrong, you're no longer, you've no longer lost your mind. You're like, well, okay, I, we may not even have considered that thing that went wrong, but we considered things that went wrong. And all we have to do now is just pivot to a new quick plan because we have a process, right? That's it. We have a planning process. So our plan's going, boom, contingency. This action went wrong. We either accounted for it. If we did, good, you move on. And if you didn't, regroup new plan quickly because we know how to make a plan. No problem, right? That's it. It's the, the formula is simple. I, I, I've watched your YouTube stuff, which I love, by the way. And you talk about uh, one thing, not being uh, overly complicated. That one thing might in and of itself be fairly complicated, but the premise is uncomplicated. And it's the same thing with what I'm talking about now. The planning process, executing a plan can be very, very difficult but it's a simple process. <laughs> okay. You know, I love David Goggins, but I'm not a David Goggins type, right? I'm not yelling and screaming at people. It's cool. Cause it, he, he can do it right. Jocko can do it. I don't, I can do it. It's just not what I lead with, but I will say, you know, I'm, I'm generally looking for some nuances, but in this case, I'll just tell people, stop. I'm not having this conversation with you. If you're worried about getting things wrong, you need to get over it because they will go wrong. So, so, I mean, you, you have been part of, of very um, specialized and elite groups. Um, you've, you've uh, I guess, I mean, you've had to work your butt off for it, of course. Um, but it's just part of these groups. I mean, there's experience and there's training. And it appears that uh, over the last 10 years, I suppose, you know, being a Navy SEAL in the 90s or the 2000s has led you to being a really great leadership expert um, in, in the last decade, let's say, mm -hmm. um, is it a small group of people, uh, you know, or is it, cause it seems from the outside, the people using Navy SEALs to help them, you know, that Navy SEAL badge, which is, which yeah. is, you know, a badge of honor to be able to help elevate you and say, you know, I'm a leader and I can help you with other people. It seems like a really small group of people. Um, is there like a, 
camaraderie or once you're out, you're out and that's it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it depends. I, you know, I, I don't keep as close ties to the SEAL community as I, I think I should. And I like, I have a couple of old friends who were SEALs and I talk to them regularly. Um, I just started talking to former SEALs uh, who have, who have shows. And, and for me, it was just a little weird. I don't know because my SEAL career ended not on the terms that I wanted it to, right? I got injured and I left uh, under a personal cloud, right? Nobody, I didn't do anything wrong per se. I got injured and I was going through a messy, messy divorce and marriage, which was spilling over into my professional life. And I got medically discharged and it just felt icky to me. You know what I mean? And, and I didn't like the way it went. And that's something that I had to get over, right? It, it's because nobody looked at me like, Oh, what a loser. That was my own stuff that I was dealing with. Um, so it seems like there's a lot of me out there right now, former Navy SEALs doing this. Um, but in the spectrum of leadership coaches, no, it's, there's not a ton. Mm -hmm. And I, and I fully intend to now start, I was, I talked to Mark Devine, who's got a very popular pod podcast. He runs SEAL Fit, super successful guy. That's the first SEAL who I went on with. And it felt good to me. You know, I was, I felt very at home talking to him. It had been a while since I had talked to somebody about that stuff and just sharing some stories. So yeah, it's, it's a small group, but it seems like, I guess sometimes if you're looking for SEAL coaches, there's a lot of us out there. So I don't know. I don't know. Is that even an answer? Well, the, 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 <laughs> reason, the reason I ask is, is it is, it seems like there's um, a mannerism. There's um, uh, maybe an approach, uh, thinking an approach, certainly like these, um, challenges or, 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 or thresholds that you have to pass in order to get through buds and what have you. And so as, I, as I'm working through your story as, as deeply as I could kind of to prep for this, I was surprised when I came across, you know, in your book, the, 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 the trip you took to Philadelphia, mm -hmm. yeah. where, where you're reading, you know, Simon Sinek's uh, Leaders Eat Last, and you find yourself having a panic attack. Mm -hmm. To me, you know, as someone who has anxiety and has stress and has worries and, and have had panic attacks, um, I had one this summer, um, that doesn't seem like the type of thing that you should have to be dealing with because you're tougher and harder and made of yeah. more than I am. So, yeah. like, one, it humanizes you, of course, but two, yeah. I, like, I was surprised. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, look, that's, you know, I, I'm really, I'm glad you brought that up because it's, it's a really important thing because it is something that we can all, panic attacks happen to us all the time. And it's something we can all relate, right? So you talk a lot about entrepreneurial work and surely anybody who's an entrepreneur has that micro panic attack almost on a, on a daily, daily basis. And the point I just want to make to people is again, this is where I try to leverage my background just for the very things that we talked about. I can't believe Errol would have a panic attack just from reading a book. Well, you're damn right. I did. And, but, what I won't do is succumb to that because all it is, is an emotion, right? It's a hard emotion that is being relived over and over again. Okay. Now in this case, I was reading in that book and it was about somebody else going through a combat experience that I could relate to. And I was enjoying it. I didn't realize what was happening until I looked at the page and I was like, why is the page all wet? And then I saw myself shaking. So as far as the ice bath and the Wim Hof training, you know, I was able to go back to process, right? And it's, pro how am I feeling? I'm having a panic attack. What am I doing? I'm shaking and sweating all over the place. How do I want to behave, right? Well, I, I'd like to be calm. What are my actions at? What's my plan? Well, wait a second. This looks familiar to me because this happens every time I get into an ice bath. That's nothing more than an induced panic attack. And I know when I step into a 32 degree bucket of ice water and go, <gasps> that's an induced panic attack. And then when I go <sighs> and I focus on my attention and I focus my breath, because I know what that does to my brain and, our, and my autonomic nervous system, it calms me down. I can calm down. I'm in control, okay? The emotion has strength but only as much strength as I let it continue to, to build up, okay? Because in the end, that's what, the, that's what Wim Hof did. He taught us, and he's now teaching the scientific community, you have taken our power away. You are making us believe that every time we have these things happen to us, we need a pill. Mm -hmm. and we don't. We're the ones who can tap into that system. So I really like to share 
those stories because I do want people to know, again, and you're very kind with your, your introduction to me and, and, and all that stuff, but I want people to know, no, 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 this happens. This happens to me, happens all the time, but maybe my background says, but, but I'm in control. I know scientifically, physiologically, emotionally, mentally, I can control that in a lot of different ways. So, And so does that, does that, I mean, I'd love to spend some time if I could pivoting into, um, you know, the planning process that, mm-hmm. that you lay out. But yep. before we jump into that, I suppose, you know, like I, I think that the world is made up of, you know, thinkers and feelers and, and maybe that's overly simplistic because of Myers-Briggs and other things, but but I've worked with lots of thinkers and I've worked with lots of feelers and there certainly is a different way people process information. Sure, you sure. know, even, even my daughter, my, my, I have four kids, my youngest is six. She can't think anything. Like every sentence she says is I feel like, like mm. um, I feel like it would be a lot of fun to go play. And it's like, <laughs> what are you talking about? Like, I'm such a thinker that it's like, what do you mean you feel like it would be fun to play? Um, mm. And so, these types of processes, um, you know, the, the, even what you just communicated in terms of, okay, so what's going on? What am I doing? Let's take an assessment. How am I feeling? Okay, this is just like this. And being able to map that over past experiences. Yep. Does, does your military background, does your training, does your leadership style, does the processes you follow just naturally attract more to thinking logical, linear type people? Does it, does it work no. for feelers? Does it work for everyone? Yeah. Yeah, so I am a big fan of all those things like Myers Briggs and stuff like that. I, I enjoy them, but they don't have a place in my process. Not and and I don't that that comes across sounding like they don't have a place here. That's not what I mean by it. It's just two different things, right? It's I think a boss should have take those you know tests for their people and things like that. But in the end, the things you need to do are the same whether you're a thinker or a feeler. Okay, so if I say my process says emotional awareness and recognition, how are you feeling? Be aware of that because that drives your actions. Okay, that's your culture. What you do, not what your label, what you do is your culture, awareness. Then we have to decide on our behaviors. How do we want to behave? If we behaved in this way, would it make me better in every aspect of my life? Would it make me a better marketer? Would it make me a better friend? Would it make me a better dad, right? Your industry best practices will fall under maybe some of those behaviors, but those are not your behaviors, okay? And then that's a good awareness stuff. That's a good decision on how you want to behave. And then you need a plan, okay? You go through these elements of the planning process, okay? And then we understand why there will be some resistance within yourself and the people around you. Now, that said, it is my contention based on my experience, right? that those elements will find you everywhere. And if you practice them enough, you can go through them quickly and then go through any leadership problem you want. Those elements mean what, sorry. Again, emotional awareness and recognition, Mm -hmm. right? Always being aware of your emotions. Mm -hmm. Thinker or feeler, doesn't matter because emotions drive our actions. And if you are not in tune to how you're feeling, literally when you step from one room to another, one interaction to another, one day to the next, from the garage to the kitchen, right? Coming home from work. If you're not aware of how you're feeling, hmm. because that's driving your action, you're just going to be acting randomly. And then you're leaving results. Do you think people are, can, can, can assess it, can um, understand it, can articulate it, can classify it? Like, do you think we're, we're good at this? I mean, it I, takes I, practice. I don't think well, I no, it, ta- it takes practice. And that's why I have a job, right? That's why when I tell people, here's the process. This process, it's not, each element does not live on an island, okay? And I hammer away, right? So if you and I were working together, we'd spend the first week on emotions. And I'd say, I need to hear from you on our app three times a day on your emotions, Mm -hmm. right? And I get it. I'll see the feedback come in. You're either doing it or you're not. And sometimes it's blank. And you might be like, well, Errol, I, I just don't have emotions. I don't even know, right? And that's Really, you don't have emotions. I hear it all the time. Or you can't figure out what that emotion is. Well, bingo, doesn't that tell you something? How little regard you're giving to the very driver of our actions? So now we need to work on it more. So it's a simple process, but it's super hard. But again, from my experience, emotions drive it all. So yeah, that's the first thing. Okay, then awareness of what you do. So everything builds on itself. So emotions, culture. At some point, we need to decide, right? Some people say, well, Errol, oh, that's your why, and maybe, but you're going to know based on the awareness. 
your emotional awareness and your own personal cultural awareness, what you, how you want to behave. You're going to see, wow. I'm afraid to make hard business decisions, right? I, I overthink, I overthink, I overthink. Okay, now you have to then decide, how do I want to behave? You have to make that decision. But that decision is unique to you, hence the art, based on what you've observed. Is that gonna be easy? No, but leadership is not easy, right? That's why leadership is such a premium, because it takes work, it's hard, it takes that reflection. Right? So sometimes you might say, I, I, I need to act with more courage. Whatever behavior you've identified that's going to make you better, that's it. Then we work on, okay, every day, hit me with how you showed courage in decision making. Right? Whatever it is. You know, it could be anything. Right? Talk to me every, at the end of every day, um, how you prioritized what was important. Talk to me about every day, how you were in the moment. There could be, there's a million behaviors. All right. And this will take a lot of work, but those do, are the things. Do, do people, yeah. do, do people, honestly, do people put in the work? I mean, yeah, some do, some don't. Right. And, and it's the ones who, and I make it very clear. I've had the, the more I do this, the more I make it clear to people. I, I promise you, this is not a check in the box program with me. All right. It's I'm not mean. <laughs> okay. But when we talk about accountability, right? You can't hold someone accountable if they don't know what they're supposed to be accountable to. I make it very clear week to week what you're going to be held accountable to, and I will ask you why you didn't do it. That is the hardest thing for people to answer. So if I said, Mark, you're going to be accountable to these three things, whatever they are, yeah. and at the end of the week, you didn't do them, and I just simply said to you, why didn't you do them? This, 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 is, this is interesting because... <laughs> Right. Oh, like that's the no, hardest no, no, no. thing. I'm not yelling at you. It's a huge problem for me because there are certain point parts where despite the fact that I have big dreams and big goals and want to make things happen, in the moments where it really matters, I become um, patient. Um, I become, I procrastinate. I, be, um, I, I become apathetic. Uh, I've had lots of conversations with, with friends who hold me very accountable. And I just go, hey, listen, man, I know you're mad. I'm just not going to do this today. And they go, they go, no, you have a competition goal. You know, you're letting yourself down. I'm just like, yeah, that's, I'm just, I'm just, I'm telling you right now, I'm not doing this. And yeah. I don't have a reason why I'm not doing it. I'm just not doing this. I think this happened on Sunday, on Sunday. Now it's, it's a Sunday. It's fine to take an afternoon off, but I knew I had things that I wanted to do. I knew I had things mm -hmm. I planned to do. And I sat there for an hour out by my pool, looking at the things I had to do, thinking of all the things I could do and going, I'm not going to do these things today. And like I was beating myself up because I was like, well, what's wrong with taking a Sunday afternoon off? What's wrong with relaxing? What's wrong with doing? It's like this push and pull of like, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. And yet I, I really should be doing it and, and want to do it and know I should, but I'm not. Yeah. And, yeah. That's, and that's and you know what you, you know what you were doing? You were doing nothing. You were doing a, <laughs> you were doing a bunch of things bad. Yes. Right. So if I, so with this conversation, I was like, okay, Sunday afternoon, right. You've got four kids. I, I presume you're married. Um, yeah. yeah. So you've got a wife and four kids and you're sitting in your backyard alone, ruminating over the work you're not doing. Yeah, so you're sure. not being, you're not being a good dad. You're not being a good husband and you're not being a good boss. You're doing nothing good. Right. So, and, and that's what I would say to you. Right. So when you, to, to your own advice, pick one thing. Right. So that, but that goes into it. What there is an emotion behind why you didn't do those things. I would, you know, I would talk to you. What, what do you think it was, right? Were you overwhelmed with the task that had to come? Were you kind of afraid that you didn't want to, do, you know, you wouldn't do it correctly? Were you indifferent towards it, right? You were just bored at the prospect of doing it. It doesn't have to be something so deep-seated, right? I was just bored and indifferent at the prospect of doing this thing, but I know I had to do it. That's still an emotion, hmm. okay? Now, my point to you would be, what did you do? You already said it. You just sat there and did nothing anywhere, right? If you had said, I put it aside and I went in and just had a conversation with my wife and we went for a walk with the kids, I'd be like, score. That's a win. You did something well, right? You made a priority and then you executed on that priority. Your, right? your line, do one thing well or two things poorly. Yeah. That's been the last five years of my life. Like yeah. just the feeling, I think the wording I used when I was talking to a friend last week was, I feel like I've spent a long time flirting with greatness.
Mm -hmm. I know a potential exists. I know we can do amazing things. We can do the greatest things, but I only, but, but I'm so busy doing a bunch of things poorly or not as well as it could be, or not executing as highly as possible or this or that balancing all these different things. I never get around to doing something really, really well. It feels like. Yeah. And look, and that's, and that's a behavior, right? So we just went through, that's how simple we went through the process, right? It's a thought process. God, how am I truly feeling? Let me identify it. It's something, right? I'm, let's just say it was indifferent at the task and bored at the, the task. And so it was stressing you out because you need to do That's still an emotion. I am bored and, and, and indifferent. What am I doing? I'm sitting here now not doing anything well, right? I'm not being a dad, husband, or boss well. Okay, how do I want to behave? Now, based on what we've just said, I need a behavioral guideline. Something is holding me back based on my emotions, and I've just been aware of it based on my personal culture. I'm not prioritizing and executing things. Pick a thing, prioritize it, execute it to completion, move on to the next. Now you have to make a decision, right? We still have to do these hard things of making a decision, but what's the behavior you need to focus on based on what you've witnessed? Now, in the 10 minutes we've been talking, that's what I would say to you. It sounds like the behavior you need to make when you're just sitting there looking at 15 things, prioritize, and then execute to completion, move on to the next. It's going to seem hard because people who have trouble with that, who go from thing to thing to thing to thing, which by the way, we could talk about what that does to our brain, fight or flight response, makes us ill. Please please do. Like, 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 let's dig into that. Okay. So I am, I am the best starter in the world. I'm super future focused. You know, another thing that stuck out to me was, you know, like the, about just the emphasis you place on being present. Mm-hmm. I live my entire life in the future. It is so yeah. easy for me. Like, like my friends made fun of me because about a year ago I was sitting one afternoon with them on and I, and I said, you know, I've already figured out what day of the week I'm going to cut my lawn when I'm retired. <laughs> they're like nice. what and i'm like well no hold on like i spent time and i'm like it's gonna be thursdays thursdays make the most sense and here's why and i give them a full breakdown and they're like what are you talking about last night i was telling my wife how scared i am that when my kids who are only ranging from six to 14 grow up and get married will i love my 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 their, their partners as much as i love them will i love my grandkids as much as i love my own kids like i'm already i'm so future focused that i'm busy worrying about yeah. stuff and meanwhile all this stuff is burning you know yeah right now. so here's so here's the thing right so again as we let's just pretend this is our coaching call this is this is my first assessment the behavior you need is prioritize and execute Okay, execute to completion. I like to say prioritize and execute is kind of a Navy SEAL ethos and probably Mm -hmm. combat ethos um, because it's just when you get ambushed, okay, there's a lot of things happening, right? Your teammates are getting shot, injured, killed, and the bad guy's got the drop on you and shooting at you. Those are two situations at play. You can't take care of both of them at the same time, right? You just can't because if you go save your teammates first, more people are going to get shot. Okay, you have to prioritize what's first. I have to suppress that enemy fire, get control of it. Then I can go to my teammates. That's part of the planning process. But so uh, when we use combat examples, I use them because it's the ultimate expression of consequence. If you don't do it correctly in combat, the ultimate consequence, right? Injury, death, mission failure, all unacceptable. So if in those situations we can prioritize and execute, I think in our personal life, we can give it a shot, right? We can try. Okay, but only when we recognize it. So what's happening? You're going from um, my process I came to find out. That's why the science, process, art, and science does follow the same process that the brain uses to rewire itself. Okay, and I didn't, I came on that later, you know, as I studied the brain. Here's a stat for you. We have between 60 and 70,000 thoughts per day. 80 to 90% of them are the same as the day before. And for the majority of people, 70% of those thoughts are related to the emotions of stress. That's Think about crazy. that. Now that's, that's, you know, those are studies. Okay. Those are not my, obviously my, my stats. What does that mean for us? That means that something happened yesterday, last week, 10 years ago, whatever it is, right. I, I know some of your, your backstory, right. And we have now thought about that over and over. We think about how that makes us feel. There's an emotion based on it made me feel worthless. It made me feel less than. It made me feel these things, okay? 
and we keep thinking about it. Now we know from science, uh, neuroplasticity, the study of, 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 of neuroscience, when we have an emotion, it literally sends a chemical to the body, okay? Mind-body connection, no longer hippie propaganda, right? It's science, we know that now, that is a real thing. I have an emotion, sends a chemical to the body, I feel that. Now, the more we think about that emotion, or, or the event that caused that emotion, the more we get the emotion, then we start to become neurochemically addicted to it. All right, so we're gonna, we can already, we're already thinking now, we're thinking now based on what we thought yesterday and the day before, because we are looking for anything in our environment to satisfy the addiction to that emotion. Hmm. I can't remember what made me feel worthless, so I have to go find something in my environment to, hey, hey, honey, you, you just walked away from me and I wasn't done. Now, ugh, I knew it. I'm no good at talking to you. Addiction satisfied, right? Meanwhile, your wife, your wife's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I didn't walk away. I'm right here, oh, right? Man. So then we can now already predict how we're going to feel next month based on how we felt back here because we're feeling and thinking and doing the same things over and over again. And then we are wiring our brain that way. Hmm. Okay, now the good news is we can rewire it, but does that sound, am I hitting any marks as I tell oh, yeah. that kind of? <laughs> so yes, 100%. I mean, it's just, um, you know, for me, respect is, is, is really important. I think, I think it is for most men and, and I do subscribe to, um, uh, you know, Eckert's, I'm not sure if you, if you know, Eckert, I think his name's Eckert. Um, the idea of love and respect women tend to, tend to, um, communicate, um, speak, communicate and feel in terms of love and men tend to communicate, speak and feel in terms of respect. It's not, it's not universal, but if we had to go one way or the other, that's a good. Yeah. Yeah. And so my kids disrespecting me, my daughter slamming the door. Um, my wife, um, you know, mid sentence, her looking down at her phone and scrolling or, or texting a friend, um, just reinforces time after time, you know, for me, it's, it's, I'm not good enough. Um, I should have known, like I, I'm a smart person. I should have been able, I should have known. Um, I should have done a better job. I should have worked quicker. I should, there it is. I should, like all of those things, right? <laughs> like, like it's just, it's, it's just there. And then every through the day, I start off my days um, full of potential, full of hope, full of fire. And I end my days with stress and anxiety and feeling mm -hmm. like garbage because, you know, in any given day, 8, 10, 12 things remind me of all of those baggage things that you just talked about. That's right. That's so, right. So, so what do we do? And, and you even said it before we went into the explanation. You're already thinking, am I going to love this person as much as that person? Are they going to love me as much as that? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do, right? And you're already projecting how you're going to feel in the future based on emotions of the past, okay? Mm -hmm. So what do we do, right? The process, the process, the process. Okay, what does that mean? First of all, you've already got the first step. How is that making me feel? What are my emotions? Now, how am I acting on it? You've already identified it. You don't like it, right? It, it bothers you. Okay, now the hard part. Well, that's a hard part, right? That identity, but you've done that work. You're very, for God's sakes, you're gonna have a bunch of people listening to this. You laying it out there. So you have no problem acknowledging how you're feeling and how you're acting. What you haven't done what it, in this conversation anyway, I haven't heard, what do you want it to be? Okay, what do you want it to be? Mm. And, and that's an important element because I can't, I would never tell somebody, look, here are the, here are the traits of a leader. You need to be courageous, you need to be honest, and you need to be whatever it is. And you might be like, what are you talking about? Like, I, I've never told a lie in my life. Why are you telling me? But it's not applicable to you, okay? That's why there's an art to this whole thing as I say, because it's what's applicable to you based on the hard work you did of being observant of how you feel and how you act. So the question I have for you is, how do you, what do you want it to look like? Okay, and you've got to define it. It could be a couple things. And now I don't, if, if I get somebody gives me a list of 10 things, I'm like, stop, pick, pick one. Because if we pick one, as you know, one thing, there will be a positive ripple effect. It will just make good, so let's focus on one behavior. If I did this behavior, would I get better? And now you need to become obsessed with that behavior, okay? It needs to be what you're constantly thinking of. Every time there is a situation happening, oh, my daughter just slammed the door. <gasps> wait, wait, what do I want it to be, right? There's a refraction period. You're still, I'm not, we can't tell anybody not to feel what they feel, okay? But what is the period from when you feel that thing to when you go to how you want to act? 
Okay. Stop act. Okay. I, this thing happened. I feel this way. I started acting this way. I did this uh, stop. How long does it take me to act how I choose to act? All right. Now the very notion of doing that and being aware of it starts to rewire our brain. Okay. That's it. Being aware of those things that I just talked about starts to rewire our brain. Now, the planning process. Okay, so am I? Am I good so far? Is it making sense? It's you're 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 great. Um, it has been told to me by strange. Like I've been I've been working across from strangers at a Tony Robbins conference conference where they literally were like, "You don't know what you want." Yeah. Um, because uh, I find it really hard. I've learned over the last two years actually that I find it really hard to just come out and tell people what I want. Right. It's, feel bossy and makes me feel uh, uh, demanding or controlling or yeah. uh, selfish or yeah. sometimes like I I have very very high hopes or like they won't like you um I'm maybe I'm not I'm not so much of a people person <laughs> that bothers me it's it's more like I have I have said certain things to people um where you know it's like like um, you know, my kids are in French immersion. We're up here in Canada. We speak French and French immersion. I said to my wife, maybe last year, I was like before COVID, Hey, wouldn't it be great if we just spent the summer in Paris, the kids can immerse themselves in French. It makes sense. Half of the people I hang out with, that makes total sense, right? Like it makes total sense that you can rent, rent a place and move off there and do that. And do and, and then there's all these other people who, who look like, what kind of crazy person are you? You're going to move to France for two months. What are you talking right. about? And so it's that like that suppressing the, 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 the dreams, the goals, the, the ambition, um, not telling people specifically, I want you to do one, two, and three, because mm -hmm. it feels controlling and it feels bossy and it, and it feels uh, like dominating. Um, and so that whole mix of it, I've realized, um, I spent a whole lot of years hedging everything I said, but mostly I really struggled to just tell people what I want. Yeah. Well, so look, here's, you know, and here's where the planning process comes, right? So, Again, you, you, you can't hold someone accountable if they don't know what they're supposed to be accountable to. You have problems telling people who work for you, I assume, right, what you want. Mm -hmm. And then I assume that things don't get done in mm -hmm. the fashion you want them to get done or in the Correct. time you want them to get done. And then you, by your own admission, either just forget about it or you take it over yourself. And then that makes you mad because now you're mad that I don't have employees who take initiative and work with autonomy. I, they just wait, sit around and wait for me to do everything. Does that, does it sound familiar, right? Correct. Correct, sir. <laughs> yes, I am correct, sir. Right. Um, so this is why I tell people, look, planning process. Mm -hmm. When you say we will be held accountable to a planning process inside that process. So I'll, I'll briefly go over it. situation. So the acronym is SMAC. It's a straight rip off from the SEAL teams, right? I didn't develop this on my own. I took it, right? This is what we used because this is what we used to achieve victory on the battlefield and keep people alive. So if these elements are good, they're applicable everywhere. We should always consider them. Identify the situation. Set of circumstances dictating a need for action. What does that mean? It means if somebody tells you something and you go, well, what are we doing about that? That, what are we doing about that? You have a situation. It doesn't need to be a problem. It can be a problem, but it can also be an opportunity. If we, if somebody says something and that's your response, you have a situation. Think about how many times companies and families are acting on things they don't need to, okay? Because they haven't identified the situation. Now, if you've identified a situation, something you need to act on, you need to have a mission. What specifically are we going to achieve? This all sounds so simple, but already... I know somebody's sitting there going, we don't do that. We don't identify the situation or the mission. We kind of have a mission, but then it sounds like it's 15 things in one and mm -hmm. all right. One mission. That's it. Now you could have several missions underneath the situation. That's fine, but they all need to be broken out separately because underneath each mission, there are going to be actions that need to be taken. Hmm. That's it. Now if you've got several missions. What do you have to do? You have to go to behavior, prioritize, execute to completion. Okay. If you have actions, things that need to accomplish, if you have a mission that needs to be accomplished, you need command. That is not, I command you to do this. That is who is in charge of what? If you lay are laying out a series of actions and you don't put who's in charge of what, you've just had a new strategy. Your new strategy is hope and assumption. 
I hope somebody does these things. I assume people should know what to do. And my, I'll just tell a cope and assumption have no place in the leadership equation. Why would you hope and assume when you could be clear? Okay. Being clear feels bossy <laughs> and hoping but, and assuming gives but, people the, 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 the vacuum, you know, like the, the freedom and the space to step into the situation. Ah, so now let me do this. Now, what I'll tell is there's a couple of elements to the process, but they're irrelevant to, to your point. I'll tell you this, and I think you'll agree with me. The leader needs to identify the situation and the mission. That's your job. Okay. Right. And you do that all the time. You have vision. You have a vision for a reason, situation. You know what you want to accomplish. Now, how do we initiate that initiative and autonomy? Well, in your mind, you've got the big boss plan. You've got your own big boss smack. Here's my situation. Here's the mission. Here, I think, are some of the actions, right? The big picture actions that need to happen. And I think Bill should be in charge of this action. I think Jane should be in charge of this action. And, you know, whatever. Fred in charge of this action. Okay? And then you kind of go through the rest of it. Big picture stuff. So far, you're not bossing anybody around, right? You're, look, you're doing your thing. You present it to the team. Folks, here's the situation. Here's the mission we want to accomplish. Here's what I see happening on a big picture, right? Whatever it is. And Jane, I see you in charge of that. I would like you to come to me with the plan about how you're going to do it. Mm. You're not giving her a laundry list of things to do. You're not micromanaging. You are giving her the initiative and autonomy by saying, here's my vision as a boss because that's my job. And now I need you to tell me how you're going to do that part. So I'll so see you tomorrow. With so you're giving command for them to develop the action plan. And then they're going to have their own smack, right? Your big picture action for them is going to be their mission. Mm -hmm. And they're going to go through, here's what I'm going to do. And then they're going to present it to you, right? They're going to say, Mark, here's what it looks like. We're going to do these five things. I'm going to have these people in charge of these things. Here's when they're going to be done. Here's a couple of things that can go wrong. And here's how often I'm going to update you on this communications plan. You're going to go, sounds good. Go for it. I look forward to our first update. Now, when you have that update, it's targeted because you already know the plan, right? So, Mark, you come to me and I say, all right, so, hey, you've got this action that's due Friday. How are we looking on that? Because what else is there to talk about except for the elements of the plan now? And it's very targeted. You are not micromanaging. You are keeping the big picture because you have a good communications plan and they're doing the work. You're doing your job, keeping the 40,000 foot view. It's as simple as that. Now it's super hard to execute, right? But does, it, does that make sense? I mean, challenge me, right? I, you know, it, I mean, it, it makes sense. It, it sounds um, slow. Um, it sounds like uh, there's um, a lot of room for, um, I, I don't want to say miss, like miss scoping, like, like it's, it's misunderstanding at the level of I'm saying one thing on this side. And I think that you're getting it. Even if you do the strategies of like, okay, repeat back to me what it is you think that we've spoken about and all of those other things. Um, just people running off in directions, missing, missing the point, missing the nuance, missing all of these things. Well, that's why they're presenting their actions to you before they start, right? So that's yeah. the thing. So when you say slow, it's yes and no. Slow because you have to take the time to go through the elements of the plan. That takes a lot of work. So when I jump into a middle of a company, right? And they're in this middle, middle of this initiative and I present this to him, you know, because they don't ever have a plan. They've lost track of anything that's happening. Yeah. So we break it down. I said, right, tell me what's happening. So we go through, I don't even need to know anything about your business. I promise you. And I say, all right, and we go through the planning process and they say, Errol, it makes sense, right? Just like you said to me, it makes sense. I don't have time for that. I said, fair enough. Fair enough. Let me ask you a quick question. If you had made a plan before you started all these actions, would you be in the position you're in now? Well, no, no, of course not. If you follow these elements, from the beginning, where would you be? Well, we'd probably be done. Well, what are we talking about? There's never too late to make a plan. There's always a situation. The situation is you have mishandled what's happened so far and you're not going in the right direction. Great time for a new plan. There's, it's never too late to make a plan, right? So yes, in the beginning, this is why people don't do it. It's why companies don't do it because it's really hard to sit down and be disciplined and then have people because they're not used to bringing the boss the plan with the initiative. If, if they're not getting it, if they bring you a plan that doesn't make sense, well, then you've, you've not articulated 
properly what the mission is or the situation. So good, do it again. Thank God you know that right before now everyone before, starts going before everyone starts doing it, right? So, you know, those are the challenges. And okay, and then the other thing is that you brought up, it, it eventually it's gonna lose track and I'm not gonna know where it is. No, that's why we have in the plan, one of the C's is communications plan. Not the soft skills of communication, right? Those are important, but that's not what we're talking about. It's when will I talk to you? About what will I talk to you? For how long will I talk to you? By what means will I talk to you, mm. right? And those, those communication plans, parts of the plan need to be very targeted. Is 100% of the information being addressed in that communication in that call applicable to 100% of the people on the call? If it's not, you've got to figure out why because we can't waste people's time. All right. So that's how you know what's happening. That's how you know. And I've heard you say it like, um, I just tell people, do it. And if you have any problems, let me know. But yeah. that's, that's fine. That, it doesn't but work. It's not, I can but tell it's you not, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, but it's not fine. Because yeah. here's why it's not fine. Because they may not know what the problems are. Because mm -hmm. they may be so in the weeds, they may not see the obvious. That's why when you talk to them on a regular basis, based on the plan you put together with them, you can see it. Hey, Mark, we're going to be late with this action about a week. And you're like, huh, okay, a week, that hurts. Why are you going to be late? Well, you know, we're just running into some problems. We're going to work overtime. We're going to get it done. We're going to buckle straps, right? All the platitudes. Now, as a leader, you love that spirit. But as we talk about culture, what is your culture? Sustainable and transferable. Is that a sustainable culture? Working overtime, buckling down, up by the bootstraps. And is that transferable to the next generation of people coming into your bit? No, that's terrible. That's, that should only happen once in a while. Okay. So they may not see the obvious. Your question might be, well, do you need more people? Well, yeah, we, I, now that you mentioned it, we could probably use one or two more people. Great. You can have Phil and, and Ted. They're just sitting around doing nothing. Will that help? Well, heck yeah, it'll help. Mm -hmm. You've now just identified the problem based on the communication that you're having over the overall plan. They can't always see it. Um, here's another question you could ask. Well, is there some training gaps, right? Or is there a knowledge problem? Is that why we're taking so long? Yeah, come to think of it, you know, the new guy doesn't really know how to do this. All right, we've got to readjust things because we don't have any more people but that's a required skill. So we're gonna move the plan, we're gonna push it to the right four months. We don't like it, but we've gotta get that person trained up because otherwise it's never gonna go right. Hmm. Problem solved, right? Not great that you had to push to the right, but now you know exactly why and what you need to do about it. So your people may not always know what the problems are. That's your job. A question I have for you uh, is, is obviously, you know, you, you speak in, in terms of, um, uh, analogies or stories through, through combat. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I have a line here, right? If combat leadership is not done correctly, one of three consequences will be realized, all of which are unacceptable, mission failure, injury, or death. That's right. Um, I have been trying to figure out how to turn up that pressure for things that do not, like, like mission failure, injury, death, not things you know that are that are happening to me. I had I had um, someone really struggle last week, and I finally called them up and I said, "Dude, man, you know, like I just heard this story about these people who won a Nobel Peace Prize for stopping a, a terrible war and genocide in Africa. Um, you know, we're trying to run a marketing agency here. <laughs> like, right. you know, what I mean, like it's like it's it's I I I get I get you know." people are, you know, the, the enemy is shooting at you and your people are down and what do you do? And the snap decisions is hard. Like, um, you know, I think in corporate, I think in business, I think in entrepreneurship, I think in family, I think in life, we just feel like we have time. We just, we, we have, we have we, time. The stakes aren't that high. We live in mediocrity. We just get comfortable with the way things are. How do you yeah. turn up that pressure? Yeah. So you don't have to, the reason, the reason that I bring up, the reason I, I give those examples is not to get people to find a sense of urgency. It's to say, but here are the principles we used. So those things didn't happen. And are the principles I'm presenting to you any different? Can you not, can't you apply these to your everyday life? And the answer is yes, right? Everything I just said to you has nothing to do with combat, but yet those are the principles we use 
to be great warriors when the stakes are high. So the point I make to people is, so when I said emotional awareness and recognition or having a plan, if it's good enough for us to use to save lives and achieve victory, the principles, isn't it good enough for you to consider, right? So we don't need to have, we don't need to create urgency where there is none. And here's the other thing. We don't need to create something of our job that it's not. I used to sell copiers. When I left the SEAL, the SEAL team and before I went to the FBI, I sold copiers and I loved that job, okay? Now, keep in mind, I was a Navy SEAL, right? You know, saving the world and then went to copiers and I was like, man, this is going to be hard. But you know what? It wasn't hard because I had a great boss and what made that boss great was the environment he created. He created an environment of predictability, okay? We knew very clearly what behaviors were expected of us and from a um, best practices standpoint, what he expected from the sales process. That was it. There was a couple behaviors he expected and there was a process that he expected you to follow. So simple. And so when I went into his office, I always knew what to expect, right? I'm having a problem with the sale. He would inevitably go, what, ske- what, what step did you skip in the process? Because if you're having a problem, you skip the step. And he was always right. So that made my life pretty easy. Oh, I'm about to go in and see the boss and tell him a problem. Oh, he's going to go back and he's going to tell me what step, step, ooh, what step I skipped. Let me see. I skipped that one. Let me just go back and do it. And now all of a sudden, I'm back on track. Now all of a sudden, I'm having some success. Now I get to go to him and give him a good report. And he goes, fantastic. Keep up, right? I don't even, you know what I mean? So it's... This is going to sound, people are going to go, can't believe you just said that. It doesn't matter if people love their job. It absolutely doesn't matter. And here's why. Because some people need a job. And the need to have a paycheck is way more important so they can provide for their family than it is for them to love their job. You shouldn't care about that as a boss because you have no control over that. You absolutely have no control over somebody's motivation to take that job. What you have total control over is the environment that you create. And that, that my copier story is a perfect example. I went from the most dynamic, exciting environment, maybe in the world, to selling copiers. And I loved it because the environment was a great environment. It was predictable. It was professional. The expectations of what was expected of us were crystal clear. And if we didn't do it, we were held accountable, asked why. Why didn't you do that? And we knew everybody was held to that. And so when everybody's held to that standard, and when you, are, when you have an environment that's predictable coming in, you enjoy going to work. You're like, this is cool. I don't really love selling copiers, but it's something I need to do. But it's not a bad place to work, man. It's good. And everybody's kind of held to the same thing. So morale gets good, right? Because the behaviors are predictable. And when morale is good, people make friends. And now you're making friends. And they say, hey, you want to go have a beer after work? And then you're having happy hours with people. And then all of a sudden, you're having success, you're having camaraderie, and you start to take a certain pride. Errol. But it uh, makes sense, right? Thank you so much for joining me. I, like, I really do appreciate the conversation. And, and everybody, you have to check out the book, The Process, Art, and Science of Leadership by Errol. Uh, I was going to say your name wrong. Dobler. Uh, <laughs> No name confidence, like I told you at the beginning. You got it, though. You What's got the it right. way for people to find you, man? Uh, you know, my website, Leader193. Um, yeah, you, know, you can find all about my leadership practice. You can find the book there. You can find out about how I incorporate the Wim Hof method, which we didn't really get to talk about. Um, all that stuff. Everything Errol Dobler, just go Leader193. That's my Instagram stuff, right? That's my Facebook stuff. So just, you know, I'm the only one who's got that, so it's not going to be hard to find me. Amazing. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate you having me on, Mark. Wasn't that something? I mean, seriously, so simple and yet so hard sometimes. Errol can help us tackle our emotional awareness like no other person. Now, key takeaways for me were this. One, God will not look for medals, degrees, or diplomas, but for the scars. Two, your emotions, they have strength, but only as much strength as you allow to build it up. And number three, pick one thing, pick one thing, prioritize, execute to completion, and then move on to the next amazing advice. Now, if you want to do hard things, 
then you have to move on what you've learned. You need to build momentum and you have to work to make yourself proud. Now, I just want to quickly remind you that you can rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts as a new podcast. I would love that. And if you're not subscribed, be sure to subscribe already. If you want to connect with me, you can drop me a DM on IG. And remember, those of us who have something to prove and show the world and ourselves that we have what it takes to make it happen. But you have to think big. You've got to be bold and you must say yes. Why? Because we, you, me, all of us, we do hard things. <laughs>